All right, RJ, to kick off this podcast, you know, normally we like to go week in review, talk about all the Kraken games from this past week, but I, I think we really got to focus on what happened in that Arizona game, because I, I really think that kind of overshadows everything else from this week, this, this game where, you know, we give them their first win of the season, a team that, you know, might not even hit double digits wins on the season, how bad they've been looking, and, you know, it was... We saw some of the same things we'd seen in previous losses from the Kraken, um, some of the same concerns we've had, but this one, it felt different. That's what I'm concerned about is it just felt like maybe the energy level from the Kraken in that Arizona game was just, it, it didn't feel like Kraken hockey, you know? No, absolutely. And and Haxel has talked about the team kind of building an identity. And we had seen that over the last couple of weeks where the team was kind of slowly but surely building their identity of being a difficult team to play against, a team that is good in transition, not just offensively, but defensively, uh, and a team that you're going to have to earn your chances against. And that team identity that was built up over the last couple of weeks completely fell apart in the Arizona game. And that identity was nowhere to be found. Um, and I guess just you had the worst parts of the, the identity that you're kind of, um, you know, we're still working on the bad power play, um, you know, the occasional forgetful defense and puck watching in the zone, the, the kind of things that we hadn't seen since, you know, the end of that first road trip uh, reemerged and uh, all very troubling signs for the Kraken. Yeah. So why don't we just kind of go, piece by piece through some of those things, right? Um, I, we'll go ahead and start with the power play. Officially now, Kraken have the worst power play in the league. Uh, Vegas finally was able to score. They went two for two on Saturday night and were able to, you know, pass both the Kraken and Arizona because of that. Or or maybe Arizona finished a little higher because they went one for one against yep, the Arizona Kraken. Arizona did go past yeah, okay. Vegas. So um, either, you know, regardless, worst power play in the league for the Kraken Hackstall kind of going into this week after the Edmonton game talked about, well, you know, maybe it, it's it's kind of it's fine. It's bad luck, bad bounces, that kind of thing. Right. Um, it's clearly not just bad luck and bad bounces anymore. This team does not generate any sort of significant chance on the power play. Um, they don't put shooters in position to score. They don't shoot for rebounds and then work to put away those rebounds. They don't move at all. Like everybody's feet are firmly planted on the ice wherever they were when they first touched the puck. Um, I, I struggle to see really anything about the current power play that should stay really like it, like it needs just a complete overhaul and a top to bottom tear down. I think. Yeah, there's, there just aren't that many good signs left. Um, and, and I know Haxtell was talking about, you know, we're getting chances and even, calling, you know, basically a power play goal uh, in that Sabres game with the Morgan Geeky goal. And I'll grant him that. It was in like three seconds after. Certainly power play influenced. But for the rest of that game, and then for pretty much the entire game against Arizona and the last three, four games before that, uh, the power play is just not generating enough chances and not looking dangerous. No, I mean, we'll go from dominating play at five on five like like significant possession time significantly out shooting opponents looking like one of the best most unstoppable teams in hockey granted not necessarily always scoring a bunch of goals from all of this that's a kind of a separate issue but to go from having that level of domination creating chances getting a lot of shots to then go on the power play and have have things just completely stall out the way they do I don't think I've ever seen a team do this before. Like, I don't think I've ever seen no. that from a team where power plays make them so significantly worse that, you know, we have people regularly in the post game lives asking if we can decline penalties. Like <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yeah, I, I will give a, a quick shout out to Steve spot and he currently runs the Vegas power play, which is the second worst in the NHL in his days with the sharks. I did see, plenty of those where it felt like it just turned the momentum the other way, but it is rare. Um, and certainly something that points to coaching rather than personnel. It's one thing if you're the coyotes who have, you know, one of the worst power plays in the NHL, but you look at what they're doing at even strength and you're like, well, this is probably just the team that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and you look at the reality of it. But the Kraken look great at five on five. They should be able to come up with an answer on the power play. Yeah, there's no reason for them not to, given the names involved, the amount of scoring that has started to pick up on this team, the depth of that too, right? Like uh, Jordan Everly woke up in a big way this week, right? First first hat trick and crack in history, all that stuff. Um, scores at the beginning of that Arizona game, but like, where has he been on the power play? I couldn't tell you the last time I've even really noticed him touching the puck on a power play, much less taking a shot of any significance. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, and- I mean, after... I think it was one of the one of the home games. I he came in, you know, for for the post game media availability, and I wanted to ask him a question about the power play, but I I hesitated because I could not remember seeing him out on the power play. Turns out he was he was on the power play in it all game, but I couldn't remember having actually seen him, so I didn't want to ask the question in case he actually wasn't on the power play unit. Yeah, so you have you have the guy who I think kind of universally was agreed upon as probably the best pure goal scorer on this team coming into the season. Uh, so you have Jordan Eberle, who we can't find on the power play. Minutes say he's out there, but you know who knows where and doing what. You have your big free agent acquisition forward in Jaden Schwartz. Again, a guy who is not unfamiliar with scoring goals at a decent clip kind of disappearing on the power play. Uh, don't really notice him, kind of hangs out net front, but you know doesn't have an impact because, again, like I said, they're not shooting enough to create rebounds, much less shots that would create a rebound anyway. So I don't even know why they bother having someone in front of the net right now, uh, especially when they're not screening a goalie. Like, I, I don't know. Like, literally none of the things that you see on power plays the Kraken are doing right now. The guy in front of the net is not screening the goalie. The defenseman from the point are waiting, you know, they hesitate before shooting. They're not just like launching one timers. They're trying to pick corners from the point shooting through like multiple PKers instead of just shooting low and heavy and trying to get a rebound off a of goalie's pads. Like, and no one's setting up kind of on the face off dot for one time opportunities. Geeky kind of is. A, a little bit. Yeah, I mean that's that's been one thing that's been refreshing to see. They moved him over, you know, a couple games go to the left side, and finally you have a one timer option. If you're running a one three one too, like the Kraken are, a big component of that is having a guy who's available on those face off dots to take one timers, preferably on both sides if you can. And Geeky really just seems like the only one who's willing to make himself that kind of option, um, which you know again just not a good a fit personnel to scheme wise right and it's telegraphed every time they even try to do it too like that's why you want it on both sides when you only have it there as one side on an option and you could tell the coyotes were watching their game film too i think it was was it jay beagle whoever 83 is for them now i I get lose track of the cap dumps but i think it was jay beagle watching him on the penalty kill he always had an eye over just kept glancing over at morgan geeky and keeping his stick right there in that lane because he knew that's really the only place they can go with this puck and if we just take it away they've got nothing um, so it's easy to watch the game film and game plan against when there's only that one option. Yeah. And then you have Gord on the other side who ended up just playing catch with Giordano, like through both power plays the entire time. Once geeky was taken out of it, it was like, that was it. There was no play to be made. They just kind of passed the puck around. We did see earlier, uh, you know, several games ago, Yanni Gord tried to take some one timers from his side he doesn't have the slap shot for it, right? Like, no. it's it's an extremely hard thing to do. It's kind of a tough angle, um, and and it's not something everybody in the NHL has, like an elite slap shot, an elite ability to just score off one timers, even if it's not a slap shot, just to you know lean in, drop to a knee or something, right, and really power a puck through um, to score from there. Yanni Gord definitely doesn't have it, so I don't know why they're continuing to put him in that position. Um, I think he'd be better a little more in maybe a net front role or even back on the point. There's no reason a defenseman has to be the person on the point. Like just because they're a little more used to playing there, there's no reason that Mark Giordano has to keep coming out when clearly he's not comfortable with everything that's going on here. Um, I, I just think... I don't know. Donskoy has looked very, very creative at times. There have been some power plays where it feels like he's the only one trying to make something happen. 
put him in a position where he's maybe not surrounded by four penalty killers at all time in that bumper role in the in the center of the ice in the slot there um give him a, a just a you know a couple seconds more time and space and maybe he can make something happen Wenberg I think if you give him more time and space he can get some passes but right now he's kind of playing that same spot on the half boards as Yanni Gord again not an elite slap shot he's not an elite goal scorer who's going to really score from there but he's an elite distributor and so you're putting him in a position where the only pass the only easy clean pass he can make is back to the point which is kind of you know not doing anything anyway or trying to force it across to the person on the other side through essentially all four penalty killers for the other team. Right. Which is good if you can do it. And on a function, you know, on a, on a functional power play, sometimes that will open up for you because you have threats elsewhere. And you saw it happen in the, uh, in the Sabres game on that Morgan geeky goal. It was that great pass across from Wenberg. And that's what he does so well um, because you caught the Sabres kind of moving up a little bit, creating that little bit of a lane for Wenberg to put that pit, that puck in. But if you're not generating chances otherwise and there's no other threat, it's easy for a defense to just take that away. Right, because yes, it, it it's fantastic when it works, but we've seen it now work, what, one out of 25 times? Yep. Like, so it's obviously, <laughs> right, so obviously it's not a chance that is, you know, a high probability of occurring uh, in a game setting. You cannot rely on it. You can't be obviously kind of building your power play around something that happens so infrequently. So, the power play, in my opinion, a lot of stuff needs to change. Personnel needs to get shifted around. Guys need to skate. That, that I think, is the number one thing that needs to happen is guys cannot just keep being planted where they are just passing the puck. It's okay to move. It's okay to confuse penalty killers with, you know, having to hand off assignments if guys are crisscrossing, right? That's where mistakes are made. That's where separation is made because, you know, guys either have to go with their guy and hope that the other, that, you know, their, their partner is doing the same, or both people have to stop and all of a sudden try to get their momentum going back out towards the half boards, which is, you know, again, going to create separation. Just moving bodies around during the power play while you're cycling the puck, cycle people around too. It will create opportunities. It's going to create time and space. It's going to open up those passing lanes. Um, I, I really don't understand why the Kraken haven't done that. You and I have been saying it for weeks now. I think everybody's, you know, been saying it for a while now. Um, so that's kind of where it's at with the power play. The other thing that you mentioned that really fell apart and reminded me of early in the season when things were rough um, was the transition game. The Kraken really had built this identity of, okay, we're going to get the puck defensively. Our forwards are going to start streaking up the ice and the defensemen are going to break out you know, a pass, and we're going to try to catch the other team, especially on line changes. Kraken do an excellent job of catching other teams on line changes where they'll have a winger kind of on the, you know, TV broadcast near side board across from the benches, and they'll be able to catch somebody, you know, usually it's like Tanev, right? And you can get into the zone with speed. The defense is scrambling to get off the bench and back into their zone, and they're kind of in panic mode. The, the goalie's in a little bit of a panic mode. Um, the Kraken have been doing a really good job of doing things like that, but we saw it in that first game against Vegas that they didn't really have an answer to Vegas's transition, and they certainly didn't have one of their own. We saw that throughout that road trip and that Columbus game and that Flyers game, and it you know reared its ugly head against Arizona again, where the team looked confused defensively, and once they got the puck, they were just desperate to get it out of the zone, so they were just pushing it out of the zone kind of haphazardly without a plan or you know they've been in the defensive zone so long the forwards aren't looking to go transition they're just trying to get a line change and so that one was really kind of disappointing to see for me for sure i mean and that's even when things haven't been going well for the crack and that's something that they've generally been doing pretty well um you know the the it hasn't always resulted in goals you know, as opposed to chances, but that's something that's kind of their, their bedrock. And even, uh, you know, the other day, you know, the last practice with the power play clearly being an issue, something you might want to work on. No, it was all transition game, pretty much all of practice. Just keep hammering away at that because that's the thing you do best. And to see that fall apart was probably the most surprising of anything. Um, and, and definitely a bad sign. Yeah. So, I mean, 
the other and, and I guess finally from the Arizona game was just kind of the lack of um, I don't want to say the lack of compete, but it was kind of a lack of compete at times. There was a lot of puck watching defensively. Like we said, the transition game was not solid. It really felt like they got shell shocked and they just got like throughout that second period, you could just see the morale leave them, which really for the first time all season, that's that's the first time all season we've seen that from them. Saw it in that Flyers game. That That game was a little bit of a mess, but it was also at the tail end of a road trip. You know, and the game wasn't within reach either. You know, you're you're looking it's four one five one six one, and yeah, it's easy to kind of just give up mm-hmm. when that's the score. But there wasn't a single moment in this game where the game was out of reach for the Kraken. No, nope. and they to still it. see that, yeah, they were leading for most of the time when you saw that happening. Yet, yet it, they were almost kind of resigned to, oh well, you know, we're gonna this one, we're gonna lose this one's not going well for us. While well, you're leading the game, um, and that was uh, just kind of shocking to see. Yeah, they were leading through that second period, and it was just really awful. Like, their play was just awful. And against that. a team on the second half of back-to-backs. You're the mm-hmm. rested team. The other team's supposed to be tired. I... <laughs> yeah, no, it it they did not look like a team coming off a big win against Buffalo. That's for sure. Um, you know, you're not even traveling cross-country, cross-time zones, any of that stuff. Like, like there really wasn't an excuse for it to happen. And, and really the most inexcusable time that it happened was at the very end. When you do muster something up, you tie the game with your goalie pulled. There is a minute and nine seconds left or a minute and eight seconds left. What are those? All you got to do is get to overtime at that point, which is clearly what the Kraken wanted to do. They weren't focused on trying to win in regulation. They just wanted to get to overtime, get that point. Uh, obviously, I know how you feel about those situations. But regardless, that's the rule, and every right. point is valuable. And and getting to overtime is just going to benefit you no matter what. It doesn't make a difference to give Arizona a point. They're not going to be competing right. with you for a playoff spot or anything like that. Um, yeah, you just have to get that point. It, it's just so important in the grand scheme of things in the season to get those games that are within reach to overtime and not lose in regulation. Right, so you claw your way back, you tie the game, you've only got to get through a minute to get to, to that point And again, you know, all doom and gloom right now, right? But the Kraken still are only three points out of a playoff spot. So it's it's not disastrous. You know, if they pick one up last night, they're one game out. Um, But you have to make sure you finish that, you know, 68 seconds that are left in that game. And to go down the ice, you know, I know Larson misplays the puck in the corner there. He's not able to stop it. It squeaks by him. But you have essentially two Coyotes beat out four, potentially even all five members of the Kraken. They just outworked them. They look like they were the only people playing the game. If you didn't know better, you would have thought the Kraken heard the buzzer go because they were just Mm kind of standing around, coasting around. And you just have Coyote go in, dig the puck out, throw it up into the slot. There's Lawson Krause of all people who then just makes a play and, and, and beats the goalie and wins the game. And it was just... I don't think I've ever seen a team rally with their goalie pulled, score a goal, and then come out of the gates from that so, so flat. So flat. And yeah, if anyone you know has an excuse to kind of be demoralized and flat, it's the Coyotes who just worked this hard to get a lead and then gave it up with like a minute to go. But no, they're they're the ones working you know as hard as could be, forechecking in the corner, and the Kraken just. Uh. Yes, that was their only lead of the night, the Coyotes. They led for, you know, not very long, half a period at most. And and then they lost it. Like, you should easily be able to take advantage of them in that situation. And the Kraken just didn't. So I don't know how much of that was. There was, you know, nobody on the team, player-wise, was stepping up and really giving that message. Um you know, certainly you would have hoped during the second intermission that somebody would have stepped up and given kind of that message in the locker room. Um, I really don't think Coach Hackstall was giving that message. It sure didn't look like it every time they would pan the camera over to him on the bench. Didn't really look like he was saying much of anything. Um, that It was just a very, very disappointing way to end that week, especially when you look at the schedule upcoming and it is it's pretty scary. There's not a lot of easy games left, you know, upcoming here. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to be all be a challenge every game kind of come going forward and you got to bank these, you know, quote unquote, easier points when you can. I mean, that's just something that 
good teams do, that playoff teams do that helps them get there is they bank the points that they should and then get which ones you can against the difficult teams to play against. Yeah, so um, we'll kind of finish up the segment talking about the other games. Obviously, the week started off with that Rangers game on Halloween night. Um, that one was just kind of like a, a, a rough, unfortunate, you run into a red-hot goalie, unable to put away some chances maybe you want to put away. But it, it felt at least like it was a close game. It was a good game. And it's one of those like, yes, we lost, but you know, there's some positive stuff to take away. Yep, for sure. Um, and yeah, just you, you face a goalie like Igor Shosturkin playing at the top of his game, and sometimes that can happen to you. It's happened to the best this season. Right. Then immediately next day, Monday night, you're on the road. You're in Edmonton. You got to face McDavid. You got to face Dreisaitl. Do a fantastic job of shutting down McDavid. Like for sure, one of the best. For sure, jobs. I mean he had very little going for him. Right, one um, of the best jobs you know anybody's done at shutting down McDavid so far this year. Um, unfortunately, and there's the other guy. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the same could not be said about Drysidel, uh, who had a heck of a game against the Kraken, and um, you know, in a lot of ways, single handedly beat them. Uh, and and you know that one was also rough because you have the Kraken who are slipping bel- below double digits in power play percentage. At that point, mm-hmm. um, having numerous power play opportunities, not being able to capitalize them on them, and then you you know look across the ice at Edmonton, whose power play going into that game was at forty eight percent, and yep. I think it's since up to fifty percent. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, night and day looking at the power play from one side to the other, and you could certainly argue that the, the power play you know may have cost the crack in that game. And I think you could add the Rangers game on top of it. You know, that was a 1-1 game for a long time, and the Kraken had power plays where getting another goal would have made a huge difference. Yeah, no, they there were power play opportunities that were dropped in both of those games that I think really could have made differences, um, especially in that Rangers game. That one was really rough. But then a couple days off, you know, some practices, a day of rest, then a day of practice, and then you've got Buffalo on a Thursday night, a Buffalo team that had started off hot on a cold streak, though, coming into this game. They'd lost their previous two on the road. They're just trying to finish this road trip, go home. They just traded Jack Eichel. They're, you know, they're captain that of last day. season. They traded him earlier that day. So, you know, the players are thinking about that and all of the drama that had been going on there. And, you know, the Kraken did look like they were, you know, they were not only the better team, but they, they outmuscled them. They outwilled them. They outskated them. They did everything we had been wanting to see, and it really looked like they were going to turn a corner with that performance because they were just so dominant. Yeah, they finally got the bounces that they had been looking for, even though early on it looked like they weren't. At a certain point, it was tied 2-2, even though the Kraken had been pretty dominant to that point. Um, but finally, the bounces went and got their way, and just like you said, it looked like they had turned a corner. That was going to be the turning point in the season. All right, we've been playing the right way for a long time. Now it's finally get we're getting the bounces that's going right for us. Everly got a hat trick. Just a overall fun atmosphere and a fun game for everyone. Uh, and everyone was feeling so good going into that Arizona game. <laughs> yeah, no, and and it is worth noting that Everly hat trick, first one in crack in history. Great to great to see. Um, good for him too, right? Officially slump broken at that point, right? Starts off the next game in Arizona, 15 seconds in with a goal. Um, Eberle is back. Eberle's playing well. That's that's good to see. Um, I I will leave kind of looking, you know, reflecting on this past week with one thing that I I want to ask you, RJ. Um, so, you know, both of us certainly, I have been um, very vocal about wanting to get kind of you know, more net front, more gritty about scoring goals, right? Send pucks to the Mm -hmm. net, get to the net, score dirty goals, all of that stuff. That is the kind of hockey that will win you a cup. That is what you need come playoff time. Um, The Kraken have not had a lot of good luck with it so far this season. Um, Is it time to maybe, you know, shelf this until later into the season and just try to be skilled, try to, you know, come into the zone and then skate across the zone. And as the goalie's moving, try to pick a corner or something, right? Something more that we see from, you know, maybe more skilled teams or, or teams that have the, you know, 30, 40, 50 goal scorers do where they're shooting a little more out. Um, and they're, and they're trying to make good shots rather than just trying to throw a puck on net. 
Well, it's a good question. And I think it's something that the Kraken are kind of trying to do a little bit as far as working on the transition, working on speed um, and, and keeping, I guess, shots from a little bit further out. But you mentioned the teams that do are the ones, you know, with the 40 goal scorers, the 30 goal scorers. You have to have the players to make it work. You have to have guys that can just beat a goalie clean with a shot. And the Kraken do have some players like that. You look, Jordan Everly certainly recently uh, has just beaten some goalies clean with shots. Uh, Yanni Gord, uh, you know, in the last game with a good shot. Um, so they have some guys who can do it, but I don't know if they have enough that it's going to generate goals for them, you know, en masse. It's, it's a way that you can kind of run hot or cold too, where, you know, if, if the pucks aren't going in for you, that's, that's kind of it because you're not getting to the net. You're not, you know, getting those chances that just take the goalie out of it. It's one of those, you know, ways of playing where it makes it easier for a goalie to beat you. Um, and certainly that's been an issue for the Kraken, uh, especially just making bad goalies look so good recently. And, and we've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, why is that the case? And, you know, no, like look at this week's games, you know, no disrespect to, you know, Miko Koskinen, Dustin Tokarski and Scott Wedgwood. But, you know, before last season, Tokarski hadn't played an NHL game in five years. You know, Scott Wedgwood, they just picked him up off waivers. Um, you know, these are not the kind of goalies that you should make look superhuman here. Um, so I, I don't think you want to do anything that leaves you susceptible to that, certainly given the Kraken's recent track record. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's kind of my answer out of that question. Yeah, I know it was, it was a thought I had, you know, just last night and I, I thought it was worth exploring. Um, I, I feel kind of similar to it's, it's, it's hard to have a deep team that, that can play that style of hockey. Um, you need a lot of really skilled players. You see that from, you know, teams like Tampa or, uh, Toronto, right. Um, we don't exactly have the same personnel as them, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so um, let's go back to Friday. Uh, mm -hmm. So not too far ago, but, you know, back to before the Arizona game when things were still good after that Buffalo win. <laughs> um, and, you know, something really big happened uh, as far as the crack and go in the, you know, in NHL circles uh, around the league, um, just kind of in general. I am, of course, referring to the Kraken had a player at a press conference who showed personality. And, and you know, I, I, I don't want to kind of seem like I'm overblowing just that, like, oh, someone had personality. But I am telling you, as someone who's been around the NHL for a very long time, who at multiple times has covered the NHL, this is exceptionally rare. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And, uh, all of us that were there, I was fortunate enough to be there and, you know, recording it and everything. All of us that were there definitely had the sense that we were witnessing something special as far as, you know, the, the amount of personality uh, showed by an NHL hockey player. Uh, we, we just kind of couldn't believe it. Um, and, you know, certainly walking away from that media availability, I'm just thinking, all right, I've got to I've got to tell people about this. You know, this is going to do numbers. Yeah. And sure enough, I tweeted out the video of it. It did. I mean, the video has about 60,000 views now. Um, you know, the tweet got 350,000 impressions on Twitter. I mean, people loved this Morgan Geeky interview, and rightfully so. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, I just... So, I mean, I, we have the audio clip. Right. So, yeah, I was I was working towards the reveal of who it was. You gave it away there oh, towards no, the I'm end. Sorry. You were doing a good job, yeah. but it's okay. So I was working towards the fact that it was Morgan Geeky uh, already who had been kind of like, you know, a, a, a fan favorite, maybe not at the level of a Brandon Tanev, but certainly kind of a cult following, I'll say, uh, amongst Kraken fans with Morgan Geeky and the Geeky squad uh, starting back in the preseason. So, you know, he comes out. Show some big personality. Yeah. Why don't you set up the clip um, and then we'll play the clip, but just kind of give us a quick like kind of intro into what was going on, uh, you know, immediately prior to this. Yep. So Morgan Geeky is coming in for his media availability and I kind of want to set it up because the, the start of the clip gets you kind of the tail end of the first question that he's, you know, being asked where, um, He's basically being asked about, you know, why he doesn't look excited, like after a goal or whatever. And he's saying, you know, like, if I never look like I'm excited about something, 
then people can't say you're not excited about something. And it, and the clips comes in and is like, you know, you can't say you're not excited because baby I am like, you don't know. <laughs> uh, and then he's asked, you know, so all this is a Jedi mind trick. And then, you know, he, he gets into talking about uh, you know, Star Wars, his experience with Star Wars and, and whatnot. So uh, I think that that sets up the clip there and we, we can go ahead and roll it. Maybe I am. This is all just that I might. Maybe. I only watch one Star Wars, so I don't know. <laughs> so, before we get into your goal, have you finally outpeated the HUD, or is that still a working problem? No, never. <laughs> you can't. You can't. You can ask them. You can ask them, but you can't. So, I'm curious, like, what is this obsession with Pizza Hut about? They make a good barbecue chicken. <laughs> So if they came to you and said, homie, we want you to be a pitch man, you'd be like, sign me I am a pitch man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, interview's done. We're good. <laughs> I can show you my gold card. It's got my name on it. You really I have promise. a gold card? Yeah, I don't carry it anymore. I got a new wallet. So. <laughs> I have it. I'll send you a picture. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> All right, so that is just a great clip. I... I mean, it, it, it's still kind of just mind-blowing for me because that's the kind of press conference you're used to seeing from NFL players, NBA players. You're just not used to seeing that from hockey players, unfortunately. Um, but I, it's so appreciative for it. And yes, I'm very jealous that I was not you know, there to experience it like you were. Oh, for sure. And, and we had, you know, we had a reporter there who, who had to like miss it. Cause you know, doing a one-on-one come, she comes back, you know, what did I miss? Like everything <laughs> we tried to just explain. Um, yeah, I just so many elements about it. The, the kind of dry tone, you just perfect. They make good barbecue chicken. <laughs> you know, like just, just perfect. So funny. The timing, you know, homie, I am a pitch man. <laughs> like, you know, kind of interjecting, uh, just, perfect perfect comedic timing um just awesome i don't know I, i've got to say pizza hut needs to get him to do commercials right like morgan geeky needs a pizza hut endorsement deal right um and pizza hut actually did respond to the tweet uh which was pretty cool to see you know he's got his gold card um yeah just just an awesome media availability um and later on actually i should mention he was this didn't make the you know the main clip, but he even talked about um, you know talking to his brother playing Xbox. They asked him you know what he plays on Xbox. You know he plays Call of Duty mostly uh, with his brother Connor Geeky, who by the way will be probably a top five prospect in this upcoming NHL draft. So um, you know he's one to keep an eye on. Um, for for those of you who do play the new Call of Duty, he says he's not a fan of the skill based matchmaking. Uh, you know he's like I'm good for three games, then I log off and I come back. It's no fun anymore. So Call of Duty fans, you probably uh, you know know what he means there. I haven't played. I, I was big into Call of Duty as, as a you know teenager. I have not played it in so long. Probably Modern Warfare Two was the last one that I got into. Um, that's that's like a thousand years ago, RJ. I know, I know, long like long time ago. Two console generations ago. <laughs> yep. But uh, anyway, love to see that personality. And if you are not a part of the Geeky Squad by now, like, what are you even doing? Yeah, absolutely should. And of course, we've got the Geeky Squad shirts uh, on our, you know, store. Uh, you could reach that by going, you know, through the website, EmeraldCityHockey.com. If you're watching this podcast on YouTube, the link is in the description. It is at the bottom below all the timestamps and everything. So, you know, scroll on down there, click on that. We got the Geeky Squad shirts there, some other shirts uh, also for you to check out. All right, so that's kind of it for cracking stuff this week. Um, something else, you know, big happened in the NHL. We already kind of touched on it. Uh, it involved the Buffalo Sabres trading their, you know, former captain, former generational talent, the guy that was going to, you know, bring him back finally after years of, you know, being mediocre at best. Uh, Jack Eichel is moved to the Vegas Golden Knights moved into the division to the you know team that was already the best team in the division. That was unfortunate for us in Seattle. Um, but I, I think the big thing that you and I are going to spend time talking about is the compensation that Buffalo got back from Vegas and whether or not it was enough. Yeah. And this is something that I think we disagreed on uh, talking about it the morning of the trade of course first thing i do when i see the trade is text you about it um and we you know we got a little bit down the road as far as the conversation to talk about but not too far because i 
you know, I put the kibosh on it saying we've got to have this conversation when the mic is rolling, you know, when the camera's on, um, because it's just so such big news. So let's get into the details of the trade. Uh, Jack Eichel traded from the Buffalo Sabres to the Vegas Golden Knights for Peyton Krebs, Alex Tuck, a top 10 protected first round pick this year, and a pick swap that sends a second rounder to Buffalo and a third rounder to Vegas. So that is the deal. And I have strong thoughts about it. And there's kind of two parts to this. And uh, I think it's probably best to kind of tackle them separately. You know, and, and the first one is the Vegas side. You know, I think this trade is an absolute steal for Vegas. Uh, and it's going to immensely benefit for them for a long time, which unfortunately for the Kraken, I think is probably the worst case scenario as far as all the places that he could have ended up uh, because this just kind of, creates this juggernaut in the Pacific division that it's going to be very difficult to get around. So let's start with the Vegas end of the deal, shall we? Cause I think this mm -hmm. might be what, you know, we disagree on as well. Um, I know you brought up, you know, some points about maybe this isn't as good for Vegas as I think. Why, why don't you get into why that is? Yeah. So obviously he's a really good player and he's coming in, he's filling one of the biggest, you know, holes that they had, which was they didn't have a true number one center uh, and, and certainly those last couple playoff runs for them have, you know, shown that that is indeed a problem for them. Um, you know, yes, he fixes that, but he's also coming with a $10 million cap hit. Buffalo did not retain any salary. Um, and Vegas was a team that was already, you know, dealing with some cap struggles. They were also, you know, a team that has some aging talent. And so, yes, Eichel is only 25. He is going to be around for a while for them. But really, a lot of the other kind of key pieces that they have are are aging. They are, you know, in their young 30s, some of them already. So I, I know the big concern is that, like, this is going to be some big five-year window now for Vegas where all this stuff's going to happen. But I think short-term, they're going to run into some cap issues. Um, I think they're going to still have to, you know, lose out on some guys. Their depth is definitely going to take a hit. It had already started to take a hit compared to what it was when they first entered the league, just as they moved out pieces to bring in other guys via trade or um, just because they were cap casualties. So I just think the cap is going to keep them from being, you know, dominant for a substantial amount of time at least in the short term. And I think the age factor of guys like Pacioretty, Petrangelo, that kind of thing is also going to kind of limit their window. So for me, I think this is something that will, you know, assuming everything goes well with his surgery and he comes back later this season and he is Jack Eichel right away, which is a big if, um, it's something that'll help them out significantly this year, next year, and maybe one year after that. But I don't know that this is really going to be something that, you know, come 2024 when the Kraken will have like their prospects all coming up and, and they'll have made their big free agency moves and all that kind of stuff is really going to be something that stands in their way. So, yeah, first of all, um, you bring up a good point as far as assuming the health and everything, because that isn't something we've, you know, really touched on yet. And in everything that I say going forward, I'm going to assume that Eichel is able to return healthy and, you know, get back to his former self. Like you said, that's a big if, you know, this is a surgery you know, that obviously the Sabres were concerned about. Um, but going forward, we're just going to assume that he is able to return to his former self. Because if not, whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just assume that to start. And, you know, you did point out Vegas isn't just giving up what they gave up in the trade, but they're also going to have to clear some cap space. Uh, which I do think is going to be surprisingly easy, easier than a lot of people out there tend to think. Um, you know, if you move Will Carrier, uh, you know, Braden McNabb and uh, Evgeny Dodonov, there you go. You're back under the cap. You know, there there are certain pieces that they still have to move um, that, that don't take a whole lot away from the roster at its depth uh, that can still get them under the cap. And now one thing that's been pointed out to me is that, you know, our teams are going to have to help you out with this. They're not just going to take on the cap hit, but I'm looking at Vegas's history and in the past, they've been able to kind of get out of some of these deals. They don't always get great value for it, but they always can get out of the deals. I mean, you look at Nate Schmidt, you know, as, as a contract that they really needed to move out. Vancouver even gave him a third round pick for it. I think they're going to find a way um, to get some of these contracts uh, off the books. And I think they'll be okay in that regard. Um, you know, as as for how good it makes Vegas, you know, 
they're already tied for the most points in the entire NHL last season. This is a very good team. And now you give them basically their biggest need that they had left, which is an elite number one center. And, you know, you don't subtract a whole lot from the roster, really. Krebs wasn't doing a whole lot for them right now. Tuck, you know, was injured for the start of this season. He's had injury problems kind of throughout his whole career. Very good player. But on balance, you take Eichel just on the ice. Eichel over Tuck and Krebs for sure. Um, and I just look at this Vegas lineup, you know, that I've kind of set up when everyone gets healthy. And I think this is just a juggernaut. I don't know how anyone is going to beat this Vegas team once everyone gets healthy. They're just so deep. I mean, you're looking at William Carlson potentially as like your third line center. You know, you talk about how being so top heavy cap wise. And yes, Eichel's a big contract at 10 million. Um, you know, it means you have to sacrifice depth. But at least for right now, it doesn't look like that. Um, you know, you, you plan this lineup out. You know, you've got a third line of like Jan Mark Carlson and Nick Waugh, fourth line of Howden, Nolan Patrick, and, and Kolasar. I think that's just fine. Um, and they don't, you know, they have enough defensive depth. They didn't have to give up Nick Hague in the deal, which is huge. Um, so I just think Vegas is looking like a very good team. Now, depends on when you think the Kraken's window is. Certainly after this Arizona game, we might be thinking, okay, maybe it's three, four years down the line. In that case, I don't think you have as much to worry about with Vegas, but certainly if you had, you know, aspirations of a deep playoff run for the Kraken in their first, you know, two, three seasons in the league, that just took a hit, I think, with this trade. Yeah, I mean, we'll see about this year because, again, the, you know, the whole caveat is he has the surgery, everything goes well with the surgery, and he's not only able to recover in time, but also get back up to speed and be 100% in time, which I'm not sure is something that anybody could have happen um just based on you know even some lesser injuries we've seen guys have to deal with in these situations um yeah you know i love how your whole argument as far as like getting back under the cap is well look if you just move out these three mid-tier guys uh everything's fine but you're moving out three mid-tier guys and replacing them with league minimum guys you know there is a drop off there and my i guess my idea is losing out on what i don't you... think there is I don't think there is. And you're looking like Braden McNabb is not the same player that he used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we recognize that name as a good defenseman. You're replacing him, you know, minutes wise. I think like Nick Haig is going to take some of that off of him. You know, Dylan Coughlin, Zach Whitecloud. You know, these are players that, you know, maybe by next season are probably just better outright than Braden McNabb. I mean, McNabb has declined quite a bit. Will Carrier is and has always been a fourth line player. Replacing him with a league minimum guy, not really that much of a drop off, in my opinion. And then, like, Dodonov, I just he doesn't really fit on the... It was a really head-scratching kind of acquisition this offseason. Doesn't really fit there, I think. So I, I just don't think they're missing that much with right. those three guys. Right, but you, you add that to what they already gave up as part of the trade. And what I'm getting at is you're, you're giving away essentially everything that you're bringing in, only it's all now focused on one guy. Because we're talking about Jack Eichel, he is an elite center, and I think his his two way play doesn't get talked about enough. Um, because I think that's what really makes him special is is how elite he is defensively. Because he doesn't put up a hundred points a year like McDavid. Um, but you're talking about moving out. You're basically moving out eighty points to bring in eighty points a year. But you're bringing in eighty points tied up in only one player who has an injury history to the point where he has only played one full season in his career. That is spanning six years now. So I, I just, I don't like the consolidation of all of that money and um, offense essentially into one person that hasn't really proved that they are capable of, of being out there year after year all of the time for you. And I think that's, I think my biggest concern um, if I was a Vegas fan, and I think that's the thing that gives me kind of hope as a Kraken fan is, look, Eichel gets hurt every year. There's, if he gets hurt <laughs> going into the playoffs, now all of a sudden the team's maybe not as deep. They they're losing out on all of what all of those points and goals that he's going to score, rather than only losing out on one player, uh, the way they would have you know previously if there was only one injury. So I, I think for me that's the thing that I think doesn't get talked about enough is you're moving out the same amount of goals as you're bringing in. Only now it's all consolidated into one body that is proven to be fragile. Yeah, and the injuries are a legitimate concern. And this is, you know, again, my argument is all assuming that he's going to be healthy. Because, uh, again, if not, it's a very diff a different conversation. But, um, 
you know, then you have the guys that are replacing, you know, you, that are replacing that still will provide some goals, some points. So I think the equation doesn't exactly even out. Um, but I mean, that's, that's basically, you know, what I look up and, and also he pushes all the centers down the lineup, allows them to have, you know, take, take on less of a role basically and get better mismatches. So, you know, it, it kind of evens out in different ways, uh, but certainly the injuries are a concern. Um, but now moving on to the Sabres end of it, um, you know, we, we got to look at the value, what they, what they got, because that's something that they've kind of held out for, right? To try and get the best deal they possibly could. And I think for the Sabres, this deal is just a disaster value-wise. I mean, I, I don't know how else you can look at it, really. I mean, you know, I, I want to lay this out first. I think people forget just how valuable of an asset Jack Eichel is. You know, here you have a legitimate number one center, hardest position in the NHL to find, most valuable position in hockey, I would say, and franchise player, top two pick pedigree, and he's only 24. Like, when was the last time that a player like this was even on the market? I, Joe Thornton? Yeah, I was going to say I mean, Joe Thornton if you're sticking strictly to centers, yeah. Right, I mean, and so, you know, 2005, mm. you know, these players become available once in a generation if you're lucky. <laughs> and so you have the rarest, most valuable of all trade assets. Yes, I know there's the injury concern, but the upside is just, you know, this just doesn't happen. A player like this doesn't become available. And you come away with a package that's, you know, upper tier, but not blue chip prospect, very good middle six winger, and a top 10 protected first. <laughs> It's FIBA top 10 protected. And, and that's basically what you come away with. I mean, that pick swap, the second and third, like if you're looking at, you know, Vegas's second versus Buffalo's third, that's maybe 10 picks of a swap. I'm, you know, I don't even want to like take that into account really. So you're just getting pros non-blue chip prospect, middle six winger, first round pick. And you look at how that compares to like any, you know, that's like a package you would get just for, you know, uh, just a good, you know, a good, you know, top two line center, you know, with a year left on his contract, something like that. Um, you know, you look at other franchise players that have gone with, you look at the Eric Carlson package that again, we, we know what it turned into and no one could have predicted the draft picks would be as high as they were, but even not even taking that into account, you've got, you know, T Chris Tierney, Dylan DeMello, who are two very good pieces. I think those two equal to equal to tuck, maybe even better as far as the value they give you on a roster. Josh Norris, who probably a better prospect than Peyton Krebs, uh, you know, Rudolph's Balser's depth forward and unprotected first, which, you know, we know how well that turned out to be. But even if you just look at the Sharks stayed good, it's a 20 something pick that, okay, that about equals Vegas's pick. And then an outright second, like that's just so much bigger of a package. And it's not like Eric Carlson didn't have injury concerns, you know, at the time. I just, you compare it to some of these deals and um, it's clear that they had no leverage. And that's the thing that you told me, right? And you're like, well, they had no leverage. This is the deal they had to take, right? Mm -hmm. But that's their own fault for waiting for mm -hmm. so long. I mean, the whole reason you waited this long is so that you would have, get to a moment where you had leverage. You know, if you were just going to settle for anything, for the no leverage package that you ended up taking, then why did you make Jack Eichel wait and suffer like this? I mean, it just... I, I think that the Sabres should should be embarrassed about how they've handled this. It's just, I don't know. I think it, it's shameful for the organization and, and for what they did to Jack Eichel and just to get that out of it. So I, I have strong feelings on this. Yeah, I mean, we've hey had, Dylan. yeah, we've both had strong feelings. I've been saying all along what they've been doing to Jack Eichel is, has been horrible. And I think as time moves forward through all sports, we're going to start seeing these practices of franchises in essence, acting like they own the players' bodies be something that, you know, more so is is frowned upon than it has been really throughout the history of professional sports. Um, so I've been, you know, very anti-Sabres organization handling this whole situation strictly because of that. Your leverage every day that you waited was, was you know, getting worse. Like, that was obvious. It was obvious back at the beginning of the summer that you were not going to come to a compromise with him. So you knew you had to move him, but you could have moved him before the amount of disagreement with his camp was made public to other teams. 
You could have you could have done it well before that. Your package would have, I guarantee, have been better then. You could have done it before teams were entering the draft. I get maybe not wanting draft picks this year because scouting was so difficult. Um, you can still ask for draft picks but next you could, year as but part you could, of a package. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just mentioning, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but, no, I, I get that. Yeah, but it's enough. But it's still then more part of, you know, teams are putting together their offseason plan, pa- you know, plan, planning for that year's draft and free agency a week after that, right? So if you get that deal done before the draft, even if it's not involving draft picks for that draft, you're now you're you're getting teams at their most willing to part with things because they still have time to plan and build around the asset that they're acquiring, fill the holes that the they just got rid of. Exactly. So it makes no sense to not make this trade before the draft and before free agency. Just for yourself and for the other team acquiring the the player, in this case Eichel, because that is where you always see the most return, because that is the that is the best place for both parties to do it. It's when you're gonna, you know, the other team is gonna be willing to give up the most. The other time you see teams w- willing to give up stuff is at the trade deadline, just because they're you know maybe desperate. You're right up against that window. You're making that decision. Or am I going for it? That gets taken away in this case because of Eichel's injury. And the fact that they did not want to let him have the surgery, even if they had let him have the surgery, but they were like, it's fine. We're going to get you out of here. Like our relationship, it's clear. Neither of us want to be part of this relationship anymore. Go ahead, get the surgery because everyone else seems cool with it. And then we'll work on trading you. You could have waited at that point, let him be recovering. And then come the trade deadline, probably gotten a substantially better package for him because he's looking ready to come in and play for the team that's acquiring him and can help them on their playoff run this year that is very much a question right now for vegas is whether or not he'll be back and to what level he'll be back so yes the sabers operated from a position of no leverage they 100 percent did that to themselves in ways that we've never really seen an organization deal with before and i don't know how much of that was say kevin adams the gm of the sabers versus ownership not wanting to give up mm-hmm. on eichel because of how much you know, they've invested in him monetarily and just, you know, face of the franchise, all of that, how much the fans have invested in him. It, it is very difficult to trade players like this. That is why they are, you know, it's a once in a generation opportunity to trade for one of them, because usually it is far easier to, you know, get rid of the coach they're having a disagreement with, or it's a lot easier to get rid of the GM that isn't, you know, willing to give them their contract or whatever. So I, you know, I my guess is ownership played a big role in why it did not get done over summer and why it dragged into the regular season. But all of that meant that, yes, this was the best package that they had available. I have to assume they would have gotten better packages from teams like potentially L.A. or Anaheim, where you're getting better prospects back. You're not going to maybe get better NHL players coming back the other way, but you're going to get better prospects to build around, which is what you're doing anyway. Say that's what it's all about anyway. I was a little confused about. I don't know how Tuck, given his his window, really helps them. I mean, yeah, maybe you just flip him for something, but it certainly doesn't help you given your timeline to compete. Yeah, but I think even that got skewed, and we kind of heard some rumblings from that um, from some of the league insiders that there was maybe a push to get the deal done sooner uh, rather than later because of the hot start that Buffalo was off to. The idea being, you go ahead, you move him. Maybe it's not the best package in the world, but if we can get back some people that can bolster this group, maybe we go on a surprise playoff run this year. And, you know, coming out of COVID, we can get that excitement going, get butts in seats, make some money back after the last two seasons, right? I I see where an ownership group could have that idea, but the bottom line is the last week has shown us that that hot start from Buffalo was a fluke. They are not a good team and they, they are, are not. Who we, they are who we thought they were. Exactly. So I think this is one of these instances where ownership probably meddled on both ends and, and both times it was not for a good result um, as far as what the front office probably wanted to be doing and handle the situation. But that is also something that this Buffalo organization has been known for as well from their current ownership group. So in that sense, I'm not too surprised. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that, I, I guess that's it for us on the Eichel thing. Um, it was, I think, a disappointing package for what it was, but I also do think it was the best that they were going to get given the circumstances. Um, and I think that, you know, yes, Vegas is made better by this, but we'll see for how long 
and um and you know it's it is put up or shut up time for them that's the bottom oh, for line sure. if, if you're vegas so we got a little bit of time left here uh not too long but we'll go ahead and do something one of the questions that was brought up during one of the post game lives this past week was how we met because believe it yep. or not, we haven't, you know, just known each other since before the beginning of time. Um, we did have to meet at some point. So, you know, I, it's been so long, RJ, that I kind of struggle to really remember has. like what the catalyst was that brought us together entirely. I think it's safe to say homeschooling was the yes. ultimate catalyst. But as far as like a, a definite moment, um, two came to mind. The first being, you know, and I'll get into the fact that we were homeschooled. We were homeschooled through um, the district at the time, our local school district at the time that had a program where you were essentially, you know, you were, you were homeschooled, but you were doing everything to the state standards. And that community, it was a community. Um, once a week, they would have something called park days where everybody would meet up. And that was kind of the time for all of us kids to socialize, get to know each other a little bit, uh, be out, play all that kind of fun stuff. Right. And, um, and there was other organizations, too, that everybody was a part of. So you got multiple park days a week and all that. Um, so I remember meeting you one night at one of those. And it was kind of like that. Oh, you like hockey, too. Oh, you like the Sharks, too, because I had grown up in San Jose. You're a Sharks fan, all that stuff. So that I remember really being the first time we communicated to each other at all. Um, and certainly that we had that kind of shared interest. As far as our friendship kind of blossoming beyond that into you know, something more substantial, the, the best thing I could come up with was reflections, which was yes. an, an art thing. Um, again, it was done through the district and then there was a state and then a national level, I think, where all of us had to like make some form of art and it had yes. some meaning. Your mom yeah, was reflections. involved. Yeah, exactly. My mom was involved in this, so I can kind of get into it a little bit. It was an art contest, you know, that I, you know, you basically you, you submitted some kind of art piece based on a theme that they had, and they had a different theme every year. I don't remember what that year's theme I do. was. I oh, do what because was it? because I got I got pushed through to the next level. the The theme was beauty is, and then you would just like fill in the blank. And my horrible piece of art was I w I won just on the title, which was beauty is everything and nothing. And I left half the canvas blank, and then I just mixed the three primary colors together on the other side, and it just turned into a brown mess. But you know, I'm telling you, it's all about how you market yourself. It's not about an actual product in this world. It's all about uh, the the name and the marketing. Oh man, back in even back in like seventh grade or whatever it was, Dylan just very much in character there with that one. Um, excuse me. So they were having the Reflections Art Gallery, where it kind of showed everyone's art pieces, you know, at the district level, and they'd vote on them and decide, you know, which ones went on to the next level. And since my mom was very active in in promoting this and setting this up uh she had volunteered uh to be you know to, to set things up for the night it was just in a um like an assembly type room at the local school and um so she brought me with her to kind of help her out and everything um your, your mom also volunteered to help right and that's mm -hmm. why you were there and so we were kind of brought along and there wasn't a whole well, lot to do. Yeah, and my yeah. picture, I was technically put through to the next round. That's also why okay, I was there. Okay, yeah, that's right. Sorry, your brilliant art piece, you were there too for the. I, I'm sure I submitted something too. My, yeah, I, I definitely, my mom made me submit something every year. Um, so it certainly wasn't as good as yours. So maybe that's just why I've left it out of the memory. But anyway, we were both there to to help out in part, um, and. You know, there was a lot of downtime, so we kind of just got to talking and hanging out, you know, as we would. And eventually everyone kind of, you know, files into the room. You've got the different people there. And um, Dylan and I were talking to each other, and there was a girl across the room. And um, I, you know, I said, hey, Dylan, you know, like, you know, check her out, you know. And, I, you know, I basically let Dylan know that I thought she was kind of cute. And um, <laughs> so... Dylan's like, all right, well, you know, you should like talk to her. And I'm like, no, no, I can't do that. Like, I can't, I was, you know, so nervous, you know, just the shy, awkward seventh grader. And he's like, no, no, I got you covered. Like here, you know, I'll, we'll, I'll take care of you. Like, oh, okay. All right, fine. Let's go talk to her. He's like, all right, let's do it. So we walk up to her and I'm wondering what Dylan's going to do because, uh, you know, like, all right, you know, he's, he's going to take care of me here. And he says, you know, hi, Alex. That's her. Uh, my friend RJ here has something to tell you. 
just completely <laughs> hanging me out to dry. I I just look at Dylan, look back at her. I, I don't I don't even remember what I said. I don't either. I, I don't think I said anything. I was laughing so hard inside. I don't think I could think about anything else. And I just I had nothing to say. I some we just basically turned around and left. She, oh man, she must have thought I was the most awkward person. So I go back to like, what the heck was that? And he said, you don't remember what you said? No, I don't. He said, I don't know. I thought you'd come up with something good. <laughs> yeah, clearly I hadn't. At that point, I didn't know you well enough to know that you're not quite you the, the on the spot that. pitch man that I that I am. Um yeah, no. Oh my gosh, I'm like tearing up just remembering because it's still so funny. Oh my gosh, it's so good. So apparently, what I got out of that was that like this is gonna be my best friend for my whole life. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that was my takeaway. <laughs> I don't at all either. Um, he goes, yes, as you said, I left you out to dry completely. Like that was like such a dick move to do. Looking back on it, like I know at the time and, it was like, like as a seventh grader, like that is so stressful. <laughs> Like, like that's everything, you know. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So that's were... that's the Dylan and RJ origin story. Yep. And you just, I guess, fell in love with my my confidence. I guess <laughs> confidence to just walk up and say, "Hey, this, <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy." <laughs> anyway, if anybody needs a wingman out there, I got you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm clearly really good, good at it. Um, RJ will give you a reference, I'm sure. Give me a reference. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind of like the big origin story. And yeah, after that, we were pretty fast friends. That's like at that point, we started going to each other's houses, all that stuff, really hanging out, watching hockey together, all that fun stuff. So um, that is how our friendship happened. That's how we've, you know, long story short, ended up here today. Uh, a lot left out in the middle there, but, you know, we'll get to yeah. that at some point, I'm sure. Um but that's going to do it for the podcast this week. Uh, looking ahead to what the Kraken have. Um, we got this Vegas game on Tuesday night. That one's going to be a tough one. It is in Vegas again. Hope the team bounces back. I think they will, though. I think there's too many leaders on this team, too many proud people on this team to let that uh, performance just go. Anaheim Thursday night and Minnesota on Saturday night. It should be fun. I will be up in Seattle for this week. I actually uh, fly up on Tuesday. So kind of rush through the, the Vegas game. We'll see how all the timing works out there. And then uh, assuming all things go according to plan, hopefully can join you at the Anaheim and Minnesota games um, up in the press Looking box. Forward to it. Yeah. So that's where we're at this week. You know, it's going to be a big week. It'll be telling for, you know, the Kraken's response to Vegas. I don't necessarily need a win out of it. I just want them to come out and play hard and, and look like they, you know, are as disappointed in the performance from last game as I think a lot of us are. Um, that's all I kind of want out of them. I'm sure you're thinking something the same. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. Pretty much just bounce back in some way, you know, show, show us you're, you're serious again. Yeah. So that's going to do it for this podcast. Thanks everybody for joining us as always. Uh, make sure to check out that merch below link in the description <laughs> of this video. Um, and uh, we'll see you all next time.